how are you doing? Welcome to Trapeza TV, the table of heavenly contents. My name is Judith. We are broadcasting from Nairobi, Kenya. We start with worship. Oh 
We praise you, Lord Jesus. We bless your holy name. We magnify you. We honor you and we adore you. You are a wonderful counselor, our wisdom. We depend on you today for increased wisdom, a higher level of wisdom. We bless you. We worship you. We welcome you, precious Holy Spirit. We magnify and glorify. You are the one who works in us to will and to do with good pleasure. And now we can work our, our own salvation with fear and reverence towards your holy name. It's blessed be your name forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. How to operate. How to operate. In intellectual equity, how to operate in intellectual equity, and this is what we call Sunesis wisdom. Okay, I want to teach you on Sunesis wisdom. So, feel most welcome. Last Sunday, I taught you on Phronesis wisdom. If you remember, there are different types of wisdom. In this particular one, we're going to deal with Sunesis wisdom. This is a Greek word. S-U-N-E-S-I-S. -S. Sunesis. It's a Greek word. It's the wisdom that in it. Okay. All right. Okay, can we carry on? Yeah. All right, that's great. How to operate in intellectual equity. Sunesis wisdom. So Sunesis is Greek for intelligence. And to be precise, it enables you to run together with concepts, ideas, ideologies, discernment. It is being together with, for example, when you're in school and your teacher teaches you a couple of things, the teacher will ask, are we together? And then the students will say, yes, we are together. Are we together? Or are you with me? That are we together or are you with me is what we call Sunesis wisdom. So for you to develop and to grow into Sunesis wisdom, which is what I call intellectual acuity, to be acute in intelligence, then you need to run together or flow together with the word of God. It's as simple as that. So that when the Lord wants to do something, he can ask you, are we together? Are you with me? Okay, I want to run with you. I want to flow with you. Are you flowing with me? So if you're flowing with the Spirit of God, according to his word, that's what we call Sunesis wisdom, flowing with him, running together with him. Okay, now it's also when perception and the thing perceived are put together. Perception, what's your perception about something? What's your perception about the word of God? When your perception of the word of God yeah, and the thing that you perceive come together, that's sunesis. For example, when the Bible says by stripes you are healed. So your perception of healing, how you perceive it, how you see the healing. When that which you see comes together with your understanding of healing, that's called sunesis. Then you will get healed. Alright? So, when you are so convinced in your perception about God's goodness and mercy and his faithfulness and the fact that he never lies. When that comforts your heart to the extent that the word that says by his stripes you have been healed, to you becomes the perception of healing. It becomes your perception. You begin to flow with it to the extent that even if there's pain in your body, you no longer feel afraid. Because you know that what God says about healing and your perception of it have now come together. Okay? So you're comforted to know that it's only a matter of time and I'll be okay. There won't be any more pain in my body. It doesn't matter even if it's a cancerous growth or some form of diabetes or whatever it is. There are certain sicknesses that sometimes medical doctors make people feel that, well, if it's cancer, you're going to die. So it's not really cancer that kills you. It's a statement from a doctor 
that gives you the negative sunesis. So you flow together with the statement of the doctor. And that sentence from an authority of a medical practitioner is what kills you, not the disease itself. I've seen people go to hospital, they drive themselves to hospital, yeah, they go to the reception, they're given a doctor, the doctor examines them, and then the doctor says, oh my goodness, how did you get here? I drove. Oh my goodness, this is stage four cancer. The moment they hear the word stage four cancer like this, they can no longer walk. They sit on a wheelchair. <laughs> Yet they drove themselves to the place. That thing was not killing them until an authority said so. Okay? Which is why the Bible says in Proverbs 18, 21, that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. So it's until somebody who has authority in a certain field tells you something. And it's until that which you perceive, yeah, together with what you've been told, flow together, coming together. What is perceived and perception coming together. That, that which is spoken by an authority begins to act. So, human beings don't really have a problem with faith. All human beings operate by faith. Even just switching on your phone is by faith. It's based on knowledge. Faith is really a competence, a knowing. Okay? Now, when an authority tells you you're going to die, then you die. Before they tell it to you, you continue surviving. Okay? But let me tell you, death comes to play when the tongue says something. And when your spirit flows together with that which is spoken. When what's spoken becomes your intelligence. Yeah. What does your intelligence tell you? That you're going to die because of cancer? Diabetes? Or any form of sickness? That you're going to die because you're feeling pain in a certain part of your body? Is that your intelligence? Is that your sunesis? Is that your perception? About life? About your body? What is your perception about your finances? The fact that you haven't had money recently does not mean you're broke. All right? Because money is a spirit. And spirits always flow to places where they're welcome. If you start hating people and you start becoming extremely bitter, you don't have to perform any rituals for demons to enter your body. As a result of your perception of people, your sunesis about people, that anger, that bitterness, that resentment, that is persistent in your life, Demons will come in. You don't have to invite them. Just by being bitter. If you practice fear, unhealthy fear, where you're always petrified, and you consistently practice that, you're not working against it, you're practicing it. You may feel afraid, but you're not afraid. But if you accept the perception of life as something fearsome or fearful, then the spirit of fear will fill you. Now, if your perception about life is that of possibility, you can do anything, you can achieve anything, do you know what will happen to you? The spirit of money will come to you. And that will attract money into your life. That's what sunesis is. It's the intelligence that you use to operate life. Okay? How clever you are when you're dealing with the issues of life. That's called sunesis. How clever are you when you're dealing with relationships, marriage or whatever, or family? That's your sunesis. Okay? Are you flowing together with your spouse? That's your sunesis. If you're not flowing together, you cannot then agree. How can two walk hand in hand unless they be agreed? Amos 3 verse 3 says. Okay? So this wisdom called sunesis will come when you read the word of God, when you study, when you practice, and when you apply what you practice. When you apply that which you are intelligent in, that which you are clever in. Okay? So if you go to school and you study your chemistry or biology or whatever, and you become clever, well-practiced, and very knowledgeable in that field, to the extent that if you're examined, you pass that exam, then you have sunesis in that discipline. Okay? Are you getting me? So a lot of times people in the body of Christ think that the things of God can be this practical, that they need to be somewhat esoteric, hidden, and they need to be somewhat ethereal they're supposed to be somewhere up in the air yeah we're supposed to imagine them and just feel them you, you don't need to be clever in these things everything is a competence and sunesis is now the mark of how clever a child of god is in the things of god you get that how clever you are how competent you are 
how skilled you are in the things of God. That's called sunesis. Is it clear? All right. Now, um, so the Holy Spirit instructs us to love God through sunesis and also to love people through sunesis. We are supposed to love God intelligently and love people intelligently with this type of intelligence, which is really a flowing together with. Okay? So as a man, you want to say, I don't understand you. And as a woman, you want to say, I don't understand this man. It means you are lacking in sunesis. That's why you say you don't have discernment. You don't have mental acuity, intellectual acuity, when it comes to knowing how to deal with man, woman, or even children. Yeah? I hear so many people saying, oh, the children of today, as if today gives birth to children. Yeah? The children of today are not as well behaved as the children of our time. When we were young, we were very well behaved. No, you're just subjugated and you are subservient and you are crushed and some, somebody put you down. That's the reason why you, you grew up so angry. Yeah? To the extent that the children that you've given birth to have rebelled against your anger. So you think they're rebellious. No, they're rebelling against a faulty, dysfunctional system. Okay? They are smarter. Okay? They have a higher level of synesis. They can confront issues. You used to be a coward. You're so scared because of the systems of governance that you grew up under and the system of education where you never say the thing. Yeah? The, the young ones today can confront you and tell you anything. And then if you call that rebellion, that's good rebellion. Okay? They have to completely dismantle your dysfunctional system. For this world to operate properly. Yeah. You know, Ecclesiastes says that. Don't say in your heart that all oh, the former times were better than these days. Because you do not use wisdom when you talk like that. Okay? Knowledge increases. Every generation is better than the former. That's how it is. So, you are older folk. Read the Bible that you know how to deal with the younger people of today. That is the intelligence you need. So you won't keep saying, oh, they're bad. You know, they don't listen to instructions. They want to do what you tell them. They are also entitled. There's, there's good entitlement, which if you don't have, you can't make money. So what you need to do is guide them never to stop being entitled, but to know how to handle it intelligently. Okay? Entitlement will give you good things if you handle it, in, you know, intelligently. If, you, if you're not entitled, for example, I'm entitled to healing. I'm entitled to prosperity. I'm entitled to peace. I'm entitled to success. That's why I speak them boldly. But you will say, oh, if God is willing, oh God, if you please, it is God's will that this person died. No, it wasn't God's will. You see, they're just not entitled to life and they did not work out their entitlement. They're not intelligent enough to understand the issues of life. Okay? All right. So Matthew 12, verse 33, um, Jesus is explaining to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the lawyers that and to love God with all the heart and with all the sunesis. Yeah, love God with all intelligence. Yeah? And with all the soul and with all the strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself is more than all whole bunch of offerings and sacrifices. So love has to be intelligent. You've got to study the person you're supposed to be loving, the object of your love. And find out how to love them, how it works. Gentlemen especially, who are called by God to lead families, ought to study the people they are supposed to love, the wife and the children. Study them. Find out what works for them. And find out how to improve them. Leaders are anointed by God to improve the society. Not to criticize it. Not to punish it. To improve it. So if you find that something is not right with your spouse, you improve that thing. You train them. On Wednesday, we taught you a wonderful lesson about how you can live without fighting. Yeah? That you're supposed to practice the law of Christ, which is the law of restoration. That you who are wise, you who are just, restore such an one, the one who has made a mistake. Restore them. Don't punish them. Restore them. If you can restore somebody who's made a mistake, yeah, you have sunesis. Because it takes intelligence to restore people. It also takes a lot of patience to do so. It might take five years for somebody to change. Are you willing to wait? That's intelligence. Just like a good business person. They invest today. 
but the return on investment comes in five years. When the five years come, oh, they smile all the way to the bank. But you who thought five years is too long, let me just sit here and see what happens. Within five years, nothing is working in your life because you didn't have financial intelligence, synesis in money. So the Lord tells us here that we're supposed to love him intelligently. We are supposed to love him in a way that causes our love and his to flow together like a river. Yeah, like one river made of two. Okay, that's the song we like singing, like that. Yeah, one river made of two. They come together and flow together. So you're going to flow with the Father in his love. How is that possible? Read what he says about love. Because the Bible says we love because he first loved us. So for you to love, find out how he first loved you. What is this thing that he first did? Do the very same thing. Okay? That's called sunesis. Intelligence. Future intelligence. Glory to God. So there's sunesis that is contrary to God's will. Sunesis is just intelligence. One can decide to invent um, wicked things. Yeah? Evil things. Uh, you can even invent things Invent things that turn people's hearts away from God. That is now evil sunesis. And the Bible says that God will destroy this kind of wisdom. It is the wisdom that is humanistic and fear-based. The socialistic approach. It is now affecting the United States. They're moving towards socialism. and moving away from capitalism. You know, the freedom to own things. For example, in the United States today, in some, in some states, you get, um, you get taxed heavily if you're using petrol, gas-driven cars, because they want everybody to start using electric cars. But you see, in a capitalistic system, you give people the choice. Do you want an electric car, or do you want a gasoline-run car? But if it is forced, then you're becoming socialist. Okay? That's, that form of sunesis is counterproductive. It's humanistic. It is humanistically fundamental. It's fundamentalism. Are you getting it? It never works. You have to give people freedom the same way God has given you freedom to serve him or not. God has given you freedom to serve him or not. That's what makes him God. Okay? The fact that he gives you a free will. The United States right now is moving towards socialism. You see? Um, they're overemphasizing global warming and environmental issues. Yeah? Now the carbon that is emitted by gasoline cars is much less than the carbon emitted by the manufacture of batteries that run electric cars. Because the metals that are used to manufacture those batteries are dug from under the earth. They still emit carbon. Okay? I can give you more statistics, but I don't want to go into that detail. The United States, the great nation, is moving towards socialism, and that's going to be how it loses its power. Because you need to be a capitalistic institution where people have the freedom to own property, to make money, to have their own thing, okay? We are moving into a world where the government wants to own your children. They want to own you, <laughs> you see? Ladies and gentlemen, even paying of taxes is your choice. You cede your money by will. How does that happen? Intelligently, you vote certain groups of people called legislators into parliament. And these people determine how much taxes you pay. So if you're not happy with that, you can get them out of office and vote in other people. It really depends on your intelligence. So the taxes you pay in your country are taxes you cede willfully to the government. Nobody has a right over your money. And that's the intelligence God has given us. Yeah? Freedom to own property. Freedom to be rich. Freedom to have things. Freedom to make decisions. Okay? That is the intelligence that works. Any other thing is humanistic and fundamental, in fact, fundamentally flawed. Okay, so governments of the world, most of them operate through this wisdom. And this wisdom comes to nothing, is what the Bible says. Yeah? So if you look at the book of 1 Corinthians 1, verse 19, the Bible says, For it's written, I'll destroy the wisdom, which is Sophia, of the wise. The wise are called the Sophos. Okay, it's actually from the word Sophia. Sophos. And it'll bring to nothing the sunesis of the sunetos, the sunesis of the prudent. Okay? So God will bring this wisdom that's humanistic and fundamentally flawed, God will bring it to nothing. All right? For example, the wisdom with which Corona was handled came to nothing. Yeah? 
when it was established that it's a must for you to be vaccinated, when matters of health are supposed to be your choice, whether you take your tablets or not, isn't that supposed to be your choice? Yeah? But they said it was a must. Fundamentally flawed. That's socialistic. It is your freedom to go to hospital or not. In fact, you can go to hospital and refuse to take the medicine that they give you. Yeah? A person can choose that they don't want to live. It's their choice. Okay? And then later they say, okay, the vaccines, you know, they're not really, you know. You know the story, yeah? After so many billions of dollars have been pumped into the manufacture of these things. Of course, people did a great job by trying to secure humanity. But the sunesis that was used was flawed. That's why it's not sustainable. It came to nothing. Yeah? It's not sustainable. Are you getting it? Wisdom must be sustainable. Vaccines, like any other, needs to be a matter of freedom of choice. The moment the government says you must take it, it's no longer capitalistic, it's socialistic. All right? And that is the sunesis that comes to nothing. That's the reason why governments of the world have failed to change people's behavioral patterns. If somebody is a thief and they're jailed, they come back to the society a better thief. <laughs> you see? Because the wisdom of the government in the cor corrective centers, uh, correctional, correctional? Correctional centers, is flawed. The sunesis doesn't work. But God's wisdom works. God can change a murderer and turn the murderer into a life giver like Paul. Saul to Paul. Do you see? God can turn anyone around. Rahab the prostitute is stabbed by God to a wonderful mother. Do you see? Mary Magdalene, the prostitute, after Jesus cast seven demons out of her, she became a totally different person. Do you see? So the wisdom, the sunesis, the flowing together with God's fundamental, God's fundamental ways of operating always works. But that of the world doesn't work. Okay? Now, look at it this way. All human beings operate optimally when they're in a group, when they're in a community. But the socialistic system tells you to stay away from other people. And the Bible says it's not good for a man to be alone. It's not good. You'll get broke if you're on your own. You'll fall sick if you're on your own. Come on, think of firewood, for example. If you're burning wood, the fire will burn as long as you're adding more wood to it. But the moment you just let only one burn, it will burn and then ultimately the fire will go off. But if you keep adding more wood, the fire gets bigger and bigger. The same applies to human beings. The more you are, the stronger you become, even economically. You see, right now in the United States, about 300, 320 million people. Yeah? That is huge. That's why they control the world, because those are all buyers. You see? Now, Nigeria is 220, about 220 million. Yeah? My country is about 55 million. You see? So my country is about the fifth most populated, the seventh most populated in Africa. And you'll notice that the GDP of every country is directly proportional to their population. The more they are, the richer they are. The, the, the richest economy in Africa is Nigeria. Okay? Nigeria is richer than South Africa by sheer numbers. You get that? So the more you are, the more successful you become. But socialism wants you to stay away from other people. You stick on your own, then you become suicidal. That sunesis is flawed. And the Bible says, I will destroy that wisdom. Okay? And I'll bring that sunesis to nothing. All right? First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.19. So I want you to appreciate one thing, ladies and gentlemen, that the, the nations of the world are ruled by a, a messed up system. The wisdom that is used to rule the world is messed up because they have rejected the ways of God. You see, Sodom and Gomorrah rejected the ways of God. They burned up. Yeah? Egypt rejected the ways of God. When the Israelites left, that nation was completely destroyed. Did you know that Egypt was, a, was ruled by a, a sunesis based on death? Yeah? Did you know that? You know that the word Pharaoh simply means one who taxes the dead, 
one who taxes the dead. Yeah. The Kayan, the original guy who was called Pharaoh, he was the deputy of the ruler of Egypt. But this guy made a lot of money by taxing the dead. He became so rich. Every time you bury the dead, you paid some money to him. And when the king heard about it, the king got very upset. When he was invited to explain why, he was so rich, he gave the king so many gifts that the king made him his deputy. So a society that grew on taxing the dead. Okay? That was their sunesis. Ultimately, what happened to them? That civilization was wiped out when the Israelites left. Okay? So if your sunesis is not based on God's word, which is forever established, it will come to nothing. So we are not here making suggestions. We are telling you what works. We are also telling you why your governments fail, why your education systems fail. You see, in entrepreneurship, for you to succeed, you need to try, experiment, and fail. Experiment and fail. Try and fail until it works. Now, Thomas Edison, who tried over a thousand times and failed until ultimately succeeded. Ladies and gentlemen, if every experiment he did was part of an educational system, he would have been discontinued from school. All right? You see, your education system tells you that if you copy from the other person, you're committing an offense. If you collaborate in an examination, you're cheating. Yet in entrepreneurship, you cannot succeed without collaboration. Are you getting that? In school, getting, a, getting it wrong is punished. Yeah? In entrepreneurship, getting it wrong moves you closer to getting it right. In school, you spend so many hours to get an A. In entrepreneurship, you spend much less time to solve a problem. The 80-20 rule. Yeah? And that's the reason why the richest people in the world don't work too hard for their children to get A's. Yeah? Instead, they cause their children to spend 20% of the time learning and 80% of the time playing. Learning how to deal with people, how to socialize, so that later they can make money. They can find out what young people like. You see, for example, the Zuckerbergs, the Jewish guy, Paul Mark Zuckerberg, at 19, looked around and thought, wait, university students need to connect. We need to communicate together. We need, we need to be friends on a gadget. Because sometimes walking through the campus to find my friends is difficult. Where can we all convene and talk and have community? Social media is really about community. Yeah? And it's ruling the world right now. It's about community. It's about people hanging out together. That's it. That's the model of social media. Hanging out together. That's the sunesis. So this guy drops out of school. I'm not telling you drop out of school yourself, unless that's your choice. He drops out of school because he found out something that the school wasn't teaching. And that thing worked. So rich people don't go for A's. And you know that very well, that A students work for C and D students. Always. Always. By the time you're done with your education and you're applying for work, you apply to somebody who was in the same class with you and was an E or a D student. And you go there with a sheepish smile because now you're feeling a bit embarrassed because you used to think that you're greater than this guy. Right now he's running a huge company and you've gone there to only get a percentage of his income. <laughs> oh, it's not about money. Then what is it about? Manipulation and wanting to rule people by force? What is it about if it's not about money? I'm not in this for the money. Then what are you in it for? Huh? What, what motivates you? Money connects people. The sunesis of God. It's like that when people transact, the seller is happy and the buyer is happy. That's love. You can easily get a spouse that way. A happy client can easily marry you. Okay? Are you getting me? But if you are not in this for the money, yeah. If you're not in it for the money, okay, let's say, for example, I choose to do something for you for free. Do you know what I've denied you? I've denied you the right to improve it. Say, no, I don't like pink. I like purple. But because I'm doing it for free, you'll just accept the pink. Are you getting that? Huh? Sometimes doing things for free forces somebody to accept what they don't like. 
I don't like this type of cake, but you already brought it. So we just have to force ourselves to eat it. I wish I paid for it. I would have bought a cake that I like. Do you see? Even if it's smaller. So transactions are good. They cause people to love each other. Transactions will cause people to stop fighting. If one tribe brings the animals and the milk, and the other tribe brings the grains and the vegetables, they say, look, for us to eat vegetables, fruit, and all that, we shouldn't attack this tribe. For us to have milk and meat, we shouldn't attack this tribe. In fact, let's not marry each other, you know? So when one brings the milk and the other one brings the vegetable, you look and you think, hmm, you look cute. Yeah, you look cute. And then you keep buying the same milk from this same person. And then you start knowing their names. You start finding out where they live. See how entrepreneurship is God's wisdom. It's unnecessary. Shortly, hey, I think we can marry each other, you know? Or we can become business partners. We can collaborate and build something better, cattle dip or something, yeah? I met a lady a few days ago uh, who makes clothes. She's an extraordinary designer. And all the buttons she makes using the cow hooves and horns. Yeah? And all her clothes are hand-woven. So beautiful. She was taking them to France for an exhibition. I was so amazed by her work. So, so amazed. You see? So now, think about it this way. Where does she get the cow horns from? To make her buttons and all the other things that she uses. Where does she get material from to hand weave her clothes? There must be a relationship. So that's what we call sunesis. Okay? Are you listening, guys? You've got to be successful in life if you understand how to flow together with other people. Right? That's God's sunesis. But the government systems of the world are telling you, no, stay away from other people. Stick, stay on your own. Yeah? Go to work, go home. Go to work, go home. Study hard. And when you sit in class, don't share with anybody. You are taught to be selfish and too independent to be successful. Uh-huh. And then somebody tells you, now you're an A student in business studies. And the one awarding you an A doesn't run any business. High class nonsense. You got A in nonsense. Because the one who gave it to you doesn't run a business. It's like somebody giving you a cup, of, uh, a cup or a glass and tells you, here is water. <laughs> then you look in and you find no water. But they say, here is water. Somebody tells you I give you power to go and do business. This one has never run a single business. They don't know how clients operate. They don't know anything about value proposition. They don't know anything about the target market. They just know theories about all these things. And such a person qualifies you to be what? A theorist? So education systems of the world is what we call the synesis that God is destroying right now. It's failing. Yes, it's failing. It's failing. Uh-huh. Let's carry on. First Corinthians 2 verse 6 says, Now we do speak wisdom among the mature, but not a wisdom of this age, of the rulers of this age who are perishing, or in other versions, which is coming to nothing, the Bible says. We don't speak the wisdom of the world which comes to nothing. There are two types of sunesis. There's one that works. It's from the word of God. There's one that's flawed, like your education system. All right? You spent too many hours in school to learn things that are useless. Why help you? You're supposed to learn what you're gifted and talented in. Yeah? You're not supposed to learn what pays most money. If you're gifted and talented in something, it will give you money. Okay? <laughs> because it will help you solve problems at a very high level because you're already talented in it. Okay? Look, ladies and gentlemen, those who win in athletics, marathons, sprinting and all that, the reason they win is because they were already talented in running. They were already fast. The kid takes off and runs faster than every, every kid in the school. So what do you do? Train them in that field. You don't train them in chemistry. <laughs> They're not going to run around carrying a beaker and a pipette, you know, straining droplets of things. 
No. Teach them aerodynamics, maybe. <laughs> that will work. Okay. They're already at first. So teach them. Then when they run, they win. Okay. We don't force a whole bunch of blobbers. You know, people who are as round as the globe. And then you put them in the field and you tell them now, on your mark, set, go. They will wobble around and probably move backwards instead of forwards. Yeah? Because of the high resistance their bodies exact or the the air exact so much resistance in their bodies. They occupy too much space. Are you getting that? Mm. Yeah. They won't do well in swimming either. They'll float quite well though. Yeah. <laughs> but they won't move, they're not streamlined. So you get a person who naturally swims and then teach them that. All right? That's what the rich do. They train their children on things they're naturally talented in. All right? So there are systems that you're taught in school that are the synesis that come to nothing. It's not the wisdom we speak. For example, ladies and gentlemen, why aren't you taught how to love people in school? They only teach you to get a good job. And then when you fall in love with somebody, you start wondering, why is this one so difficult? I was happy before I fell in love. Yeah? This thing is stressful. Now I texted and I'm not getting an answer back. Before, you didn't have those, that pressure that somebody has, is supposed to call you or respond to your text message. You see, because you are not taught the synesis of relationships, how to communicate. So you got into this beautiful thing and now your heart is full of fear. Are they going to leave me? Uh, did I say something wrong? Uh, what's going on? Why are you quiet? Before you got into this beautiful thing, you're fine. Now that you've gotten this beautiful thing, you think you're in prison. Why? Because you are not taught how to love. Thank God we are teaching you how to love. Glory to Jesus. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Now you need to endeavor to operate in the wisdom that's from above. That's what we call synesis from above. Not synesis from beneath. James 3.17 says, however, the wisdom that comes from above is first of all pure. The wisdom is pure. Then peace loving. Then gentle. Willing to yield. Full of compassion and good deed, and without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. Okay? That's the wisdom that's from above. Ladies and gentlemen, I dare say, and I know some people don't like it, but I will say it anyway. Sexuality is a choice. Okay? Do not parade the way you sleep with somebody out there as a right. Make it your private choice. Okay? I hope you know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to parade out there and create all manner of festivals based on the fact that I sleep with my wife. So, the fact that you sleep with that person shouldn't be a big deal out there. It should be a private choice. Enough said. Okay? You got me, didn't you? I didn't mention anybody's name. I'm speaking wisdom, that's from above, that is first of all pure, peace-loving, gentle, yeah? Not full of bravado. Don't make your sexuality something that is, is so obnoxiously aggressive, yeah? Since when did having sex become such an aggressive thing? Huh? You see, that's the wisdom from, from underneath, from the world, yeah? Why can't you just fall in love with that person quietly and be happy and wear whatever colors you like? Happily, just the, the two of you. You can make it if you try, just the two of you. Okay? But why do you, why do you make it a policy? Since when did sleeping with somebody become a policy? Uh, I remember a certain great president coming to our country many years ago. And he started bullying our president. He started telling our president, could you please tell your people to have sex in this particular manner? And our president said, that's not an issue for us. Yeah, I think we need to give our people food. <laughs> I think that's more important than telling them to have sex in this way. Yeah, that American president came to bully us and our president refused to budge. And recently somebody interviewed our new president 
in the same same way how do you make having sex a policy just so nasty that's twisted yeah ladies and gentlemen it's like making eating nutrition a policy yeah it is your right to have carbohydrates it's your right to have vitamins it's your right to drink water if you don't drink water we need to create laws that force people to drink water <laughs> look at that level of foolishness and you're there even pumping funds into it they must drink water they must drink water drinking day everybody must drink water everybody wear blue and drink water it's a choice if you want to drink water or not yeah or it's like telling people take vodka all of you need to take vodka if you're going to feel nice and warm during winter you must drink vodka it is a policy in our country in the nation of Russia for you to drink vodka vodka drinking day is a government policy that's rubbish nutrition giving birth or not getting pregnant or not is a private choice the moment somebody starts teaching you how to sleep with somebody and makes it a policy that is socialism that's so necessary that's twisted okay so God, is, God has promised to destroy the ability of his enemies to operate in the natural, in the spiritual. He, he has promised to destroy their Sophia. That is the ability to operate in the natural, in the spiritual. Yeah? The ability to dream and to have visions. Yeah? The ability to do politics and accounting. Those systems. That's Sunesis, which is contrary to his will. That's Sophia whose functions are contrary to God's will. God is destroying him. He's done it before. He's doing it again. Okay? And he's also promised to destroy the wisdom of the sophos. These are the learned and skilled people in our society. The sunetos. The sagacious ones of our society. The ones who boast of tremendous wisdom based on age and experience. He's promised to destroy that. That's what the word says. Did you know that Jesus operated in sunesis? And that's how he was able to answer the doctors of the law in ways that baffled them. Yeah? He used scripture. Dr. Luke says in Luke 2.47 And all that heard him were astonished at his sunesis and answers. When the Spirit of God is with you and in you, people will be astonished at how you answer questions. Without fear. Okay? With sunesis you can answer any and all questions that are given to you. About life and the world to come. Yeah. Paul was a wonderful minister. He prayed for the Colossians to be filled with this synesis. And accurate knowledge is what we call epignosis. Yeah. And Sophia. Now you know what Sophia wisdom is. I'm going to teach you in details about Sophia. But it just in summary, Sophia is the wisdom that enables you to deal with spirits and things that are natural. It is the wisdom that enables you to dream dreams and to see visions. That's the, prof the prophetic realm. It's the wisdom for accounting. It's called Sophia. It's also the wisdom for doing politics. Politics is not for everybody. There are people with that wisdom. They do politics so successfully. They have Sophia. Okay? It is called supreme intelligence. All right? So Paul prayed for the Colossians to be filled with that Sophia and to be filled with accurate knowledge, epignosis. Okay, and to also have sunesis, spiritual understanding. That is Colossians 1 verse 9. The Bible says, For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the epignosis, accurate knowledge, of his will in all Sophia, all wisdom, and sunesis. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. He also prayed for Timothy to operate in sunesis. In 2 Timothy 2 verse 7, he said, Consider what I say, and the Lord give you sunesis in all things. So I'm here in the name of Jesus praying for you to have sunesis in all things. Sunesis in money. Sunesis in marriage. Sunesis in physical health. Sunesis in spiritual matters. Sunesis in the prophetic. Sunesis in whatever you do. Have sunesis in all things. Flow together with God's wisdom in all things. It's possible. All round sunesis. Glory to God. So the hidden things of God become apparent when sunesis is activated. They become real. 
That's what Paul told Ephesians. He told them, if you study the revelation God has given you, you would get synesis of the hidden truths about Christ, the mysteries of Christ. Okay? So I release that upon you right now. In the mighty name of Jesus. Ephesians 3 verse 4 says, Whereby when you read, so you see, so this comes when you read. I mentioned that quite early. When you read, you may understand my sunesis in the mystery of Christ. Paul had a sunesis in the hidden secret of the anointing Christ. And the Bible says here that when you read, you'll have an understanding of that knowledge, of that sunesis. Beautiful, yeah? So you need to study until you have the full assurance, plero, pleroforia, full assurance of sunesis in the accurate knowledge of the secrets of God's kingdom. That is Colossians 2 verse 2. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and to all reaches of the full assurance of sunesis. So that you may have accurate knowledge of the mystery of God, of the Father, and of Christ. How amazing. So these secrets are revealed to people, especially if you talk in tongues. You know that talking in tongues unravels mysteries. First Corinthians 14, 2, the Bible says, For the one speaking in tongues does not speak to people but to God. For no one understands him. Howbeit, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Yeah? So the one who talks in tongues speaks mysteries. Yeah? The accurate verity is granted to those who pray in tongues. So when you pray in tongues, sunesis is increased in you. Because you get to know the mysteries. That the way Paul said. But the, the mysteries of the anointing. My sunesis in the mysteries of the anointing. So for you to have sunesis, running together with intelligence, perception, in prophetic things, talk in tongues. Alright? Talk in tongues. Talk in tongues. If you want to flow together with God, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 2, when you're talking in tongues, you're talking not to men but to God. You're flowing together with him. Then you download his verities, his truth, his wisdom. And when you apply them on the face of the earth, they work. Okay? So Sunez is, a, is spiritual intelligence. It's the forensic department of the prophetic. If you're clever and highly skilled in a field, because you're endowed with Sunez, whether you know it or not, whether you know it or not, if you are highly skilled in the field, it is because you are endowed with senses, whether you know it or not. But knowing it gives it power. Because we operate by knowledge, the devil operates by ignorance. So if you know that football is your senses, your intelligence, go for it. If you know that singing is your senses, go for it. Okay? And share it widely. The sharing of your faith becomes effective. When you acknowledge, when you have accurate knowledge of your sunesis. Okay? So study, listen, hear. Okay? There are some people who don't study, but they're sharp in mentorship and apprenticeship. A guy like Kanye West, for example, says he's never read any book. He's never read one book in his life. But he knows a lot of music and knows a lot of entrepreneurship. How did he know? He knew by listening to other people. So you can read books, you can also listen to other people. All that is study. So his sunesis came because of learning from others. It just did come. Are you getting it? Yeah? Richard Branson has written many books, many business books. But he's never read any himself. Nowadays he reads a lot. But before he wasn't reading at all. But he's written books in business, having not read a single business book. Yeah? Because he had a natural sunesis in entrepreneurship. All right? Ladies and gentlemen, do you realize that the flawed educational socialistic system of the world today is such that if one is super intelligent, and they call that dyslexia, they make it a condition. They make super intelligence, super sunesis, a disease. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? There are people who look at letters and they start to play. They start to move. They're extremely good in animation. They know how to create cartoons. Because cartoons are first drawn. And then they're animated. A person who is so-called dyslexic will see the drawing and the drawing begins to move long before they animate it. That's significant sunesis. 
But in the world, because such people are different from others, they are classified as dyslexic. Like they have a certain condition, a certain disease. How horrible. How do you call intelligence disease? How do you call super senescence disease? For motion pictures to have motion to them, it takes such people with such brains. When they look at things, the things just move. Everything moves. I remember Richard Branson saying he'd go to school and the letters would just move. They, all of them would just move up and down. So he couldn't make it through his high school. He had to drop out. It was too intelligent for the education system. Yeah. He was already moving things. <laughs> Goods are already moving, you know. So education systems that want to make everybody the same is socialistic. All of you are setting the same exam at the same time, in the same way, marked by the same person, socialistic. What are we supposed to do? Read the Bible and you'll get wisdom. Okay. A degree qualification is good, but it's not necessary for everybody. Okay. There are people already qualified. Okay. Oh, all of you must get a degree qualification. You're becoming socialistic and fundamentally humanistic. There are those who don't need it. Bill Gates dropped out of a very good university. To date, there isn't one university that's not using his inventions. Yeah? Okay. So, I'm not telling you to tell your kid to drop out. I'm asking you to look and see what soonness the child has. If the child is finding it difficult to write, they are finding it difficult to write. They write and the letters are moving. They are playing like that. Don't say the child is sick. That child is too intelligent for the things you're telling them. They are too spiritual. They are in the realm of mysteries. Okay? If a child is so creative that they are asking questions that are away from the syllabus, don't bring them back to the syllabus. You're messing with the world changer. Okay? If a child is so inquisitive, ever asking questions, and say, oh, you're wasting everybody's time. Meet them later, after school, and answer all their questions. You could be talking to your next president. You could be talking to the next inventor of what's going to help the world. There's a gentleman who right now uh, is operating something called hydro panels. He actually literally gets water, the moisture that's in the air. He gets it, condenses it, and turns it into water. And he says, it can change the whole world and solve water problems. Just getting water from the air. You say, how possible is that? Where does dew come from? When you wake up in the morning and there's water all over the grass, it came from the air. So he just does that. He creates dew, okay? And he creates so many liters per square meter of air. Okay? Are you getting that? Can you imagine that's not a thing they teach in school? And if you try to talk about it, they tell you, no, no, it's not possible. It's never been done before. The trouble with the socialistic system is that if something has not been done before, then you are not permitted to do it. <laughs> Nobody ever did that before. Nobody ever did it before. So don't do it. Come on, go ahead. Be strong. Sunes is upon you. Be the first person to do those things you're thinking to do. Even if they sound so crazy. Alright? Go ahead and do it. If you're watching me and you don't know Jesus, your Lord and Savior, I want you to get saved because he's coming back soon. It's not a myth. It's not just a story. He's coming back soon and he's coming for those who are saved. He's coming for those who believe in him. Those who depend on him. Not the perfect. The ones he's perfecting. Yeah? The ones that love him. I want you to be one of those people that loves Jesus. So say this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you're the son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin and rose again for my justification. Today I receive you as Lord and Savior. I receive eternal life into my spirit. I'm now saved. Glory to Jesus. Thank you so very much, those of you who tune in. Thank you so very much. I see a number of you up here. I thank God for you. We love you so very much. May the soonness of the Holy Spirit operate in your lives. In the mighty name of Jesus, may you be anointed for success. May your inventions 
and may your ideas and the things you're talented in succeed exponentially, tremendously. May the world recognize you as a talented, super talented fellow, okay? If they don't agree with you, it doesn't matter. Just do that which God created you to do, all right? Never fear persecution. They'll always dismiss you, and if you continue, they will ridicule you. If you continue, they will fight you. If you continue, you will win. That's how it always works. The one focused on changing the world, who has passion, even when fought by the whole world, always wins. All right? I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. I'll be teaching you on wisdom for finances. All right? Have a wonderful time. Bye-bye.